I want you to go to Matthew chapter 20. If you would please in your Bible, look at that, open right up to it. How about that? Matthew chapter 20, and I want to preach a, a message that may be a, a little unusual, but I think it's going to hit everybody at home, amen, going to be completely, almost completely honest. We know I'm going to be completely honest with you on this message. Uh, I preached this a long time ago in the domes, uh, probably 12 years ago, I don't know, but uh, is Kelly Cody in here? If he does, he's got it written down every message I ever preach. I preached that one on offense. He goes, Pat, no, the one on uh, Elijah and, uh, and the widow woman. He said, look at this. You pe- preached this seven times in the last 15 years. So. <laughs> hey, I just followed the example of Peter and Paul who said, it is needful for you to be put in remembrance. That's what they said. All right. Pray with me real quick. Jesus, as I deliver your word, I pray, Lord, that you get me out of the way. Seriously, Jesus, that I deliver it the way you would have it be delivered. Lord, this is your church. This is your word. And Lord, I am your servant. And I ask for your anointing, not only on myself, but on this people. Give us not only ears to hear, but a heart to comprehend and understand. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 20. Are you ready? I think I can read better without reading glasses. How about that? It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he, had, when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So he goes out at 6 o'clock in the morning looking for laborers. Agrees with them, a penny a day. Who wants to work for a penny a day? I didn't think so. Okay, well, they did. So he sends them into the vineyard. He went out about the third hour or 9 o'clock. And he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, Go into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And he went out about the sixth hour, and about noon, and then about three in the afternoon, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, five o'clock in the afternoon, he went out, and he found others standing idle. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all the day long? And they said to him, because no man has hired us. And he said unto them, go. Somebody say, go. Why are you standing there idle? Christian, why are you standing around idle when the king has already commanded you to go work in his vineyard? He said, go. Whatsoever is right. When the hour was come, verse 8, The Lord of that servant said unto his steward, Call the laborers, give them their hire, start from the last, and work your way up to the first. And when they came that were called at five o'clock, and they worked one hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, those that were hired at six in the morning, they supposed that they, there's your problem, they supposed that they should have Receive more. They supposed. That's where we get in trouble. When we think God's unjust. When we think God's not fair. They supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, uh uh-oh, they murmured against the goodman of the house saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and you have made us equal unto them which have borne the burden and heat of the day. I'd have said that. How about you? No, this is not talking about socialism. It's talking about the kingdom of God. And he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a penny? Take that is yours and go your way. I will give unto this last even as unto you. And I'm going to end it right there even though there's more to the story. Now this is a parable that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. And I believe it has several messages in it. One of them being those who got saved right before Christ came back shall receive as much honor as those who got saved 2,000 years ago. 
They receive the same life. They receive the same heaven. They receive the same mansion. But that's not, what, that's not the only lesson from this parable. So I want to preach, uh, and I believe this parable is saying that, you know what? You are not always going to agree with God. And so I've titled this message, God and I Don't Always Agree. Have you ever disagreed with God in your life? Have you ever gone to God and said, God, I, I don't agree with that. I read this in the Bible, and Lord, I just, I don't agree with that. God, I, or I, something current, God, I don't agree with how you handled that situation. Have you ever disagreed with God? Have you ever voiced your disagreement to God? Thank you for three honest people. Have you ever lied to a preacher in church? Amen. So, I want to preach a message called God and I haven't always agreed. And every time I preach this, he's let me live and I thank him for it. And I mean it. So in the book of Isaiah, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. And people will be like, well, Pastor Mike, the New Testament says we have the mind of Christ. That we do, but you don't know everything God knows. You don't see everything God sees. The Bible says man looks on the outer appearance, but God looks upon the heart. I said in first service, I don't like it when people say, Pastor, I know your heart. No, you don't. You don't know my heart. There's no way you know my heart. I don't know your heart either. All you know from me is what I let you see and what I let you hear. Now you can say, Pastor, like Andrew said a minute ago, I'm, I'm sure, I, I, know, I know what your character is like. Pastor, aren't those the same? No, they're not. There again, with my character, I only reveal what character I want you to see. The Bible says char- your character is really who you are when no one's watching. So don't ever come to me and say, Pastor, I know your heart. I'm going to say, no, you don't. You don't. Only God really knows my heart. But I know your character. And from what I see of your character, I appreciate you. So we don't see like God. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God's all-powerful. We're not. We're flesh. He is not. So when God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, which is pretty high, by the way, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Can we agree that there are going to be times that we're going to read or we're going to see something that we're not going to agree with God on, that we would have done different? And see, young people, especially you that are new in your faith, You need to learn this early on in your walk with Jesus, that God is good and God is just and God is holy and God is righteous and that he is the righteous judge who sits on the throne judging right all the time. He never makes a mistake. He never does anything out of the foundation of his holiness and of his love. Never. Never. We'll read things in the Bible and we'll be like, man, I don't know. And that's where a lot of American Christians, I'm going to pick on them because that's where I live, they leave off God because they'll say, you know, oh yeah, God was good to me. Jesus was good to me. He came to me in a time of need and and he met my need and everything. Then they'll read what God says about homosexuality and they're like, oh, well, I don't know about that. God, I think you, God, hey, It's 21st century. And all of a sudden, you see, because you're going to either read something or you're going to experience something that's going to cross grain with God. Hello. And when you get to that place, If you haven't settled it in your heart that he is just and he is holy and he is good and he is righteous and he sits on the throne judging right, you may fall away. 
And you may go and form a God of your own imagination. And you'll come out and you'll say, well, my God would never do that. You're right, because your God's a figment of your imagination that you've made up. You've broken the first commandment that says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any image. It's true, though. It is heavy. This Christianity isn't for sissies. This Christianity isn't, uh, you know, come to Jesus, he'll put springs on your wagon and make your journey easier. No, the call to Jesus is come and die. That's what Jesus preached. If any man come to me and not deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. He's not worthy of me. You've got to settle it, Christian, in your heart. God is God. There was none before him, neither shall there be after him. He sits on the throne judging right, even when it cross grains with how we would do it. Are you listening to me? So, true faith is this. True faith. What is faith? Faith is trust. Right? Right? If I trust you, that means I can lean the whole of my being on you because I trust you. I trust in your love. I trust in in your protection. I trust in your willingness to... I trust you, right? Faith is trust. Faith isn't a force that Star Wars would have you believe. It's trust built on a personal relationship between you and the lover of your soul. His name is Jesus. So... Faith, true faith, is believing that God is right when you disagree or when you don't understand. That's true faith. God's not flesh. I cannot always see the logic in what God has done or is doing, but I trust Him and I know that He is right and I am wrong. And there's something I am not seeing. There's something I haven't considered. Case in point, God tells Joshua, I want you to go into this city. I want you to kill everybody. Man, woman, child, sucking infant. I want you to kill all the animals. It's in your Bible. Shoot, I knew it would get quiet on that one. Pastor Mike, you agree with that? I don't agree with that. But I'm not God. I don't have infinite knowledge. I don't have infinite sight. I don't have infinite perception. That's in your Bible. I know Christians that have gone away because I just don't, I ain't going to serve a God like that. You don't even know. You, You don't even know. I love it that God just has that stuff right there. Now he knows. And he's right. Did that put a block in front of some of you? I hope not. I hope it didn't. So, let's look at the faith. Here's the faith of so many Christians in America. Right here. I have confidence to believe that God will do it like I think that he should do it, like I think that it should be done. That's not faith. That is not true faith. When, it, when you say, if you've ever said, I've lost faith in God, it means that God finally did something or you finally read something in His Word, hear me, that you thought he should not have done. In other words, he didn't do it the way that you would do it. And you say, I've lost faith in God. You never had faith in God. You only agreed with God and walked with him. How can two walk together except they be agreed? You only agree with God and walk with him as long as he did things the way you thought it should be done, the way that you would have done it. Hello? 
That's not faith at all. I'm going to pick up my, my youth pastor, Pastor Mike, over here. Pastor Michael, wave so everybody knows where you're at. There he is right there. Just come back from anniversary. Woo, now I'm going to throw him under the bus. Uh, Michael and Sarah head up our youth group with some other amazing leaders that are sitting around it. We love them. We thank you so much. They head up our youth group. It's uh, incredible. I love it. I don't change anything. I never dip my hand into it. Nothing. It's beautiful. And so, so let's just say uh, someone comes to me, me, this Pastor Mike, and says, Pastor Mike, I've lost faith in Mike Eskenazi. I had faith in him until this certain incident happened that involved uh, my youth. All right, now, no, you, you didn't have faith with him. You didn't have faith in him. You just agreed with him as long as your youth, your teenager, didn't get into trouble, didn't get singled out, didn't get talked to, didn't get rebuked. Didn't get instructed. But when that happened, see, you had faith as, as long as he did things like you would. I mean, they do some very unorthodox things in youth group. But when he did something in youth ministry that involved your teenager that you didn't agree with, you're going to say, I've lost faith in Mike Eskenazi. No, you never had faith in him. You just went along with him as long as he did what you liked. But when your teenager got confronted, right or wrong, doesn't matter, all of a sudden now you say, I don't have faith in Mike Eskenazi. People do that with God. You only believed Mike was right as long as you agreed with the way that you would have done it. And the funny thing is, you've never, you've never been a youth minister. It's amazing how many people that's not in ministry want to tell the people who are in ministry how to do their ministry. It's crazy. So, let's jump to the next level. The next level of faith here in America. You ready? Here it comes. I, can, I can't see it, Pastor, but I know that God will explain it to me someday, and then I'll understand it. Now, that's not true faith either. You say, what I... What do you mean? I'm saying I trust God and I know that he'll explain it to me. So, no, that's still not true faith because you're still requiring God to do something in order for you to trust him. See, there's a song came out years ago. And now you'll know why I'm not on the worship team because I'm going to sing it. And it's called, We'll Talk It Over in the By and By. We'll talk it over, my sweet Lord and I. I'll ask the reasons, he'll tell me why. When we talk it over, in the by and by. Well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. That's just a song. That's not a Bible verse. And so the second best faith in America is right here. I can't see it, but pastor, I know that God will explain it to me someday. And then I'll understand it. That's not pure faith. Pure faith is better than the first one. Can you say amen? Pure faith says this. I don't ever need an explanation, pastor. If God never explains it to me, here or when I get to eternity, I don't need an explanation because he's God, he's right, he's just, he's holy, and he sits on the throne judging right whether I ever understand it or not. He's God, and like Job, I will say, even though he slay me, yet will I continue to put my trust in him, and it's not blind faith, it's built on his character. Because we don't know everything. 
I'm sure you're sitting there and there's things that you've read or God's done that you don't agree with. And some of you have maybe even stumbled over it and it's stunting your spiritual growth. And I hope this message will help you realize he never has to explain it. You know, the first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. If you can get past those first four words, you're on your way to getting saved. People say, well, Pastor, God never explains where he comes from. I disagree with that. God said from everlasting to everlasting, I'm God. God said, there's never been any before me, neither shall there be after me. He says, I know not any other God. He is God and God alone. The whole reason we're here is because he's there. If he wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. And if you're like me as a boy, you laid on your bed trying to wonder where God come from. And you're like a pinball machine that kept tilting. Anybody ever... Lay in bed at night and say, where'd God come from? I wonder where God come from. The rest of you don't have an imagination or what? What's the deal? I don't know. Laura's like, I wonder where Taylor came from. My goodness. <laughs> Just want to see if you're still awake. Pure faith says, if I don't agree with God, Excuse me, it says, I don't agree with God. But if I don't see eye to eye, I believe God is right, I'm wrong, and if I die and never understand it, and if through the ages to come, he never tells me why he did what he did, he is still God, he is still holy, he is still just, and he sits on the throne judging right. Captain Kirk, would you come, please? Now, I want to give you a few things, just a few. There's, the list is longer than this. But God has let me give this list and live, so I thank him for it. I want to give you a little list of things that God and I don't see eye to eye on, that we don't agree with, okay? Number one, and it's not in any certain order, Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira, people, believers were selling their homes and their land and they were bringing the money to the apostles and laying them at the feet of the apostles and they were giving everything they had and the apostles were distributing it. Remember that, Acts chapter 5? Acts chapter 4 actually. And then Acts chapter 5, here comes Ananias and Sapphira. And they, let's just say, let's just say they sold a piece of land for $50,000. And they brought 30,000. And they said to the apostles, we have given all. Thinking, it's amazing how many people think God can't see their little. So they had 50, they sold it, they sold it for 50. They brought 30, they kept 20, no problem until they said, we've given all. And God killed them both. Peter said, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. I don't think that's, I think that's a little severe. Have you ever lied to the Holy Ghost? Have you ever withheld that which God, from God, have you? I just think it's a little severe. I think maybe they should have been rebuked, reprimanded, maybe put on church discipline for a little bit. Maybe had their names in the bulletin, and nice fire, tried to cheat God. Don't do business with them. They're going through a repentance program right now. We're going to reinstate them in a few months. But no, God just killed them in the New Testament under grace. I, I don't know about you, but I think that's a little severe. I definitely don't agree with this one. Peter being allowed and being honored to preach at Pentecost. The Apostle Peter, after he stood there and said, I'll never deny you. And then in the presence of Jesus, where Jesus could see him, he denies Jesus three times. Right? Peter did. All the meanwhile, John, the beloved disciple, he's the only apostle at the cross witnessing Jesus' crucifixion. I think John should have been honored to preach on Pentecost and not Peter. But God didn't see it that way. God thought Peter should preach. 
I don't know if I would have put Rahab the harlot who's not even a, a Hebrew. I don't know if I would have listed her in Hebrews chapter 11 along with the great women of God like Sarah and the great men of God like Gideon. I don't know if I would have done that, but God chose to do it. That former prostitute, he honored her and put her in Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of faith. How about that? I don't know if I agree with, with Jesus when he comes out of the tomb. First one he appears to is Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. I don't know why he didn't appear to John or one of the other or, or his mother. He appeared to Mary. Of course, I learned in Bible school the reason he appeared to women is because he knew they'd tell. <laughs> Where were the men? They were all hiding, cowarding in a room somewhere. Yeah, come on, women. They didn't go to the tomb until the woman came back and said, hey, he's not there. And they said, you lying. I don't necessarily agree with God using three murderers to write four elevenths of the Bible. That's right, Moses, David, and Paul. Murderers, especially David, gives the gives the killing order to the guy that's going to get killed. Now don't look at me like, oh, pastor, I think it's, listen, there are people that you won't even sit under who have less of a past than that. But you judge them unworthy of you sitting under them. And yet God chose in his wisdom three prior murderers to write four elevenths of the Bible. Don't worry, he's only 18 more. I don't agree with God not letting Moses enter the promised land just because he got angry and smote the rock. I think maybe he should have just rebuked him and allowed Moses to enter. But no, Moses couldn't enter because he smote the rock twice. Now see, listen, in every one of these, there are object lessons and there are spiritual lessons deeper than what I, without the Holy Ghost, can comprehend. Now the rock typified Jesus Christ. And so the first time God told him, smite the rock, water came out, water symbolic of life. Can you say amen? And then the second time they needed water, they needed life. God said, don't smite the rock, just speak to it, Moses, because Christ will not suffer affliction a second time. And so when he, he got mad and he smote the rock, you don't smite Christ. He went to the cross once. Did, I don't care what the Catholics say. They crucify him every mass. No, he was crucified once. That will never happen again. He'll never take a beating again. Read it in your Bible. When Jesus comes back the next time, he's taken down liars. He's taken down murderers. He's taken down rapists. He's taken down child molesters. He's taken down thieves. He's taken them down. Read it in your Bible, Revelation 19. I don't necessarily agree that Lot's wife should have been turned into a pillar of salt just because she looked back. And there again, the spiritual principle isn't the fact she looked with these eyes. The spiritual principle is she looked with these eyes. She looked with the eyes of her heart. She longed for Sodom. And God turned her into a pillar of salt. I think it's a little severe. Anybody else have any problems with Scripture? No? Look, one, two. Okay, good. Last one, I, I don't think Paul should have suffered as much as he did for the gospel's sake. I, I think God could have made it a little bit easier. He wanted his word to go into all the world. I would think God could have made it a little bit easier to get this word out, could have been a little more protective of Paul. Hello, I'm complaining. God's letting me live, thank you. I mean, doesn't that make sense? Go in all the world and preach the gospel. Lord, I'm with you always, even in the world. But you're going to get the crap beat out of you. You're going to get beheaded. And you're going to get whipped. 
I would have thought God would make it a little bit easier. But he didn't. Now listen to me. I might have done things different. I might have seen to do things different. But I'm not God. And I'm not omniscient. And I'm not all present. And I, I can't see the inner workings. This one thing I know. God is holy. I'm wrong. And God is holy. And God is just. And God is true. And God judges right. And he sits on the throne judging right. So hear me. God was right when he killed Ananias and Sapphira. God was right when he let Peter preach at Pentecost instead of John. God was right when he put Rahab the harlot in the Hebrew hall of faith. God was right when he turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt. God was right when, 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 he, when he said to Paul, these are the things you must suffer for my name's sake. He's holy, he's good, he's right, he's God, he's always right, and he sits on the throne judging right. God, God was right by not letting Moses enter the promised land because he smote the rock that represented Christ twice. God was right to allow three ex-murderers to write four elevenths of the Bible. You gotta settle it in your hearts, Christian. Is he holy? Is he just? Is he true? Does he sit on the throne judging right or does he not? Because I promise you, if it hasn't happened yet, it will happen. The day's coming when you're going to read something, you're going to experience something that's going to cross grain with your beliefs, with your finite mind and your finite vision and your finite knowledge. And at that point, you're either going to have to say, God, I don't agree and I'm out of here. Or God, I don't agree. But you know what, God, even if I never understand why, I trust you. I trust you. You sit on the throne judging right. And God, if you never reveal it to me, even in eternity, you're God, you're holy, you're just. And the judge of all the earth does right. The king of the universe sits on the throne judging right. And I thank you for it. Would you bow your heads, please? Please bow your head and close your eyes. I want to ask you two questions. Please, everybody, bow your head and close your eyes. Are you here today? And you say, Pastor Mike, I walked with Jesus at one time. I really did. But Pastor, something happened. Maybe something I preached today happened. I don't know. And you say, Pastor, something happened, and I, I drifted from Jesus. I went away from him. But Pastor, today, Today, I want to recommit my life to Jesus Christ, not a church, not a religion. I want to commit, recommit my life to Jesus. I want Jesus to come into my life and forgive me of my sins. I want to follow him as my Lord and Savior. Or question two, are you here today? And you know about Jesus. You know him mentally. You, if someone were to ask you, you believe in Jesus, you say yes. But he doesn't have your heart. You have a head knowledge and not a heart knowledge. And you're here and you're convicted by the Holy Ghost. And you're saying, Pastor, I want to receive Christ into my life as my Lord and Savior. I want to repent of my sins. I want to receive forgiveness. I want Jesus in my life. And Pastor, I want to begin to follow him today. So if that's you, Pastor, I need to recommit my life to Christ. Or Pastor, I want to surrender my life to Jesus with no one looking around right where you're at, please stand to your feet. We want to pray with you. Not going to call you to the front. Just want you to stand to your feet. We want to pray with you. Are you here today? Pastor, I need to recommit my life. Or, Pastor, I want Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Please stand. There's one. There's two. There's three.
And while you're standing, I want you to start talking to Jesus right now under your breath. Because I can't do nothing for you but pray for you. But Jesus can hear you and he will forgive you and he will cleanse you of all your sin. And he will come take up residence in your life and his power and his presence will be in you if you invite him in and surrender your life to him while you're standing right now. In the, you do it right now. Don't wait for me to pray for you. You do it right now. Anyone else? Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. Anybody, young person, old person, it doesn't matter. Middle-aged, anybody. I'm going to wait five more seconds. Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. I need him. I need him. Amen. Is Kirby and Jessica here? Did I not? Did I miss them? Michael and Sarah, would you go in the back, please? We're going to pray this prayer, and then I'm going to dismiss you to go back with Michael and Sarah. They're going to take you for three minutes, and they're going to pray with you. They're going to put a gift in your hand. So you that are standing, let's pray this prayer. Everybody, let's support them. Pray it with them. Say, Jesus. I come to you because of your love, because of your mercy. I deserve nothing, yet you grant me everything you have. Jesus, I turn from my sins. I turn to you, and I ask you, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life right now. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I receive you, I commit my life to you, and I thank you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's give Jesus a round of applause, come on. There you are. Amen. You three, please, right now, real quick, there's Kirby back there in the green shirt and his lovely wife with him, Jessica. Please go back with them right now. They'll take you for three minutes. Come on, do it. I don't care if you've been back before. Go again. Go again, Seth. Amen. Give them a hand as they go. Come on. Come on. Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Let's stand to our feet, if you would, please. Lord, I pray for these people. Jesus, I pray specifically for those who've ever struggled with your word, who've ever struggled with your character, who've ever struggled, Jesus, with something that you've done that they didn't agree with. Lord Jesus, I pray that when they're done wrestling with you as, as Jacob did with the angel, Lord Jesus, that they settle it in their hearts that you and you alone are God. You and you alone sit on the throne judging right. And Lord, if they never understand it, yet they trust you because of your holiness, because of your goodness, and because you are God and you can be trusted. Bless them, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.